Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is in our midst. He is in our Good morning, beloved brothers and sisters. Today, the Church of the Most High God, His Kingdom, the Body of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one and the only Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, celebrates its day of triumph. Today, we see icons, and people think the celebration is about icons. That is partially so. This day is actually called the triumph of Orthodoxy, the victory of Orthodoxy. And we celebrate the last ecumenical council, the last of the seven great councils that gave victory over heresy. But actually today we celebrate the victory over every heresy. Every heresy. We celebrate the victory of the church that God has strengthened and given to us. And the church has gone through many, many struggles. Today the reader read to us from Hebrews, where St. Paul describes the trials of the Old Testament righteous and their agonies and pains and martyrdoms and the things that they went through. And the church, founded by Christ our God, the Messiah preached by those men who has now come in the flesh and given us his church, can show forth equally, if not far more, in martyrdoms, in trials, and struggles, and in blood, and in agonies and in pains that it has overcome by God's grace. When the church was founded, it endured martyrdom for centuries, not a few years, but for centuries, blood flowed like rivers for a long time. And finally, when our Holy Father Constantine came and gave us freedom, the murders ended, but the heresy started. And the church was torn apart by heresies and by horrendous warfare between different groups within the church. And after the time of the heresies came the time, times of invasions when the Muslims came and conquered our territories and enslaved our people and killed more of our people. And then we had a time of troubles that went on until the 1800s with the Muslims. But in the meantime, we had schisms with the Latins, and half of Christianity was lost to grace, was lost to the Holy Spirit. And yet, the Church continued, all the way to communism and through this also. The Church has continued through all these struggles, through all these battles, through all these wars. And God has raised up great pillars, just like the ones that were spoken of by Paul in Hebrews, Massive men were raised up to guard the church and to lead it and to hold it and to maintain it. And yet, they did not do it by themselves. They never did. They did it by the power of God. And if you read the Old Testament, you know this is true. When Moses had to lead the people, he didn't do it by his own strength. He did it by the power of God. When David had to lead, he led by the power of God, for which, to whom he prayed always. If you study the prophets, the prophets spoke the truth because God illumined them. Elijah called down fire from heaven by the power of God. And our fathers were exactly the same. God guided the church throughout this entire time. It was not by the power of men, but it was by the power of God that this happened and always happened. Beloved, despite all the great gifts that all the great pillars had, and our pillars are the great hierarchs, based with the great Gregory the theologian, John Christus and Athanasius and Cyril, John the Merciful, Gregory of Nyssa, Ambrose of Milan, and all the Holy Fathers, they all had great gifts, massive gifts, but they all relied upon God. And in the beginning of Lent, this is such an important thing for us to remember. All the icons take their image from Christ. All the icons take their power from Christ. Every icon is an icon of Christ. And we only paint images of those who become like Christ. We don't paint images of those who are not. And so everything comes from Him. Everything depends upon Him. And so when I began my Lenten reading, reading this wonderful book, Unseen Warfare, the author of this book opens by saying, pleading with men, he says, do not trust anymore in yourselves, anymore. You have to trust only in God. He said, the reason men suffer so much is because they don't stop trusting in themselves. They don't stop relying upon themselves. They don't stop following their own ideas. God is waiting. He's waiting for men to give themselves to him. He's waiting for men to do what he would ask them to do. He's waiting for men to rely upon his power. We cannot deify ourselves. We have to wait for God to do this. And we have to turn to him with our own labors, with our offerings, with our sacrifices, with our prayers, but he is the one who gives the victory. He is the one who gives the increase. He is the one who makes the seed to grow. And so oftentimes men don't trust in him. They trust in themselves. And I thought a lot about this, and I was deeply convicted. And I thought to myself, even though I thought, men trust so much in their own thoughts. And I thought, but God is infinite. God's power has no beginning. It has no end. God's knowledge is like a sea whose depth we do not know and whose farthest edges we cannot even possibly fathom. And yet men would trust in their own ideas over this God. And then I thought about the minds of angels, and these minds are perfect in that they are without passion. They're without 
sin and without iniquity, and yet their minds are hopelessly limited compared to God's, hopelessly limited, because they're just creations. And so could you trust the mind of an angel without a God? No. His mind is weak compared to God's. <coughs> and the mind of man is great. In fact, it may even, be, may even be loftier than that of the angels, and yet man's mind is corrupted. And I thought about this more. I thought, what is man's mind like? And I thought, man's mind is corrupted by passions. His mind obsesses over attachments and small things. He is full of prejudices and biases. His mind is deceitful sometimes, most often to himself. He often then deceives himself about what he is, about what he sees. Men are ignorant, ignorant of spiritual things most importantly, but deeply ignorant about worldly things too. And finally, men are willfully ignorant. And what I mean by that is that man's mind is subject to pride. And the proud man is the one who doesn't know. The proud man is the man who's blind to what he doesn't see because he presumes he knows. Already. He cannot be taught because he presumes he already knows. And now you see why there is so much pain in the world. Because can the arrogant man learn? Yes, he can. He can learn, but only through pain. The arrogant man will learn only by pain, only by pain. That is the only way he learns, is by falling down and getting up again and realizing that he fell because of his own pride. The humble man is very different, though. The humble man learns from God every day. The humble man is like a little child with his hands outstretched to his father, asking for bread, and his father puts bread into his hand every day. The bread of grace, the bread of, of piety, the bread of wisdom, the bread of discernment, the bread of righteousness, the bread of obedience, it doesn't matter, all of them. He puts it into the hand of the humble man who simply leans upon him and says, God, I don't know. Teach me. I don't understand. Teach me. My thoughts are wrong. Teach me. And God teaches. Every day, he teaches. Without fail, he'll teach that kind of man. Beloved, we wouldn't trust a prejudiced, a prejudiced judge. We would not trust a biased one. We would not trust an ignorant one. We would not trust a willfully ignorant one. And we would not trust an immoral one. And yet, we rush so quickly to trust our own thoughts and to lean upon our own strength, which is non-existent. It doesn't exist. There is no strength. And it gets even worse than this, way worse. Because I can give to you another example that is even more frightening than this. Think about Solomon, who received wisdom directly from God, like a direct input from God. Solomon humbled himself in the beginning, and God was impressed, and he said, What do you want? And Solomon asked for wisdom, and God says, What a good thing to ask for. I'll give it to you. And he gave Solomon wisdom so great that Solomon was greater than all the men of the East. And the scriptures say that his wisdom was greater than all of Egypt. And Egypt was civilization itself. And so Solomon was wise beyond measure. Wise in earthly things, yes. But he was wise also in spiritual things. The mind of Solomon could delve into the highest reaches. He could ascend to the highest reaches of God's mystery. And he could dive into the depths of his hidden things. And Solomon writes in these books, the Proverbs, the Book of Wisdom, the Book of the Song of Songs, which is an entirely allegorical spiritual reality. In Ecclesiastes, he writes these deep books. And yet Solomon ends badly. He ends so badly. Because though he receives this wisdom, which is not human, it's from God, yet he loses it. Why? Because he doesn't rely upon God. He trusts in himself. Solomon reaches a point where he begins to think that this wisdom is actually his, that he owns it, that it's, it belongs to him. And Solomon errs. He begins to err badly. The mind that was ascending into heaven becomes obsessed with the bodies of women. Solomon exchanges heavenly things for carnal things. Solomon has 700 wives and 300 concubines. And he lives this life of absolute debauchery. And it goes far worse than this. Solomon's mind goes to women, but it doesn't stop with women. It goes all the way to demons. Because Solomon begins to worship them because his wives tell him to. And so the man who is wiser than every man of the East and wiser than all Egypt is led astray by his concubines, his harlots, and is taught to worship Satan by them. And he even builds temples for these harlots so that he can worship with them. Now you see what happens. That even if a man has all the wisdom of God, he will lose it if he doesn't say with God. He will lose it if he tries to walk by his own power. Solomon, laid, Solomon walked his own path. And in doing so, he fell away. Our Holy Father Andrew, speaking of Solomon, says these words. He says, Solomon the Wonderful, who was full of the grace of wisdom, once did evil in the sight of heaven and turned away from God. Carried away by sensual passions, he defiled himself. Alas, the lover of wisdom became a lover of harlots and a stranger to God. Now you see, beloved, that we have to trust in him. Compare this to St. Basil the Great, St. Gregory the Theologian, St. John Chrysostom, St. Ambrose. Massive men, St. Cyril of Alexandria, 
massive and intellects higher than we can imagine. St. Gregory the theologian said of St. Basil, I have never met a man more intelligent than him. Never met a man more intelligent than St. Basil the Great. In earthly matters, and heavenly matters, and yet he remained with God for his whole life. He walked with him. He humbled himself and stayed with him. And God increased his wisdom beyond all measure and maintained it. Solomon had it with him, he lost it. St. Basil never lost his wisdom. He grew it continuously, continuously. And so did all the other fathers that I mentioned, because they were humble. They were so humble. They didn't rely upon their great intellects. They knew where their intellects came from, and they relied upon God, and they relied upon his power and his strength. This feast is given to us that we might learn to trust completely in God, who has carried the church. He carried it. He carried Israel. He carried the church. And he will carry each and every one of you, if you will let him carry you, all the way to Pascha, all the way to paradise. Beloved, do we really think so little of Jesus? Do we really think so little of him? That we would trust our own thoughts over him? That we would trust our own power over his? That we would trust our own designs, our own ideas over him? That we would trust ourselves more than Christ, who is the wisdom of God incarnate, the word become flesh. We would trust ourselves more than him. I think this is foolish. A wise man once wrote, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, he shall direct your paths. Wise words. Wise words. If only the one who had written them had actually followed them, then he would not have followed them. May we do what he said, but not as he did. May we listen to these words of Solomon and the Proverbs throughout land. May we actually put them into practice. May we rely upon them. May we rely upon God. And may we not trust in ourselves at all. We might not follow Solomon into darkness. On.